arcade machines, once spread all over the world in bars, GameStop and discos. They were loved by many children for their fun and addicting games, but feared by even more parents facing their children spending all of their money. In the early to mid 90s the arcades started to vanish due to high competition, bringing an end to the golden age of arcades. Home consoles and computers were able to deliver similar games with just a fragment of the coast facing the arcade machines a dusty death. But hold on, arcades never really died down. They are still popular in Japan. In western world they started to get more and more attention again as their now grown up children remember their childhood and want a piece of that back. Since the early 2000s emulators started to arrive bringing the old arcade games to your home. More and more ROMs and RIPs of the old arcade machines became available. To a point that we know this can play almost any arcade game that was out there. Well, except for bully views of course. Having an emulator on a PC though isn't as much as fun as standing in front of such a machine. The feeling of the arcade joysticks and buttons, the stereo sound hammering right at you and the smell of wood grain is something we cannot really reproduce on bare emulators. So people started to build their own arcade machines and controllers for this very purpose. And so did we. With that small history I welcome you to the first episode of how to build your own arcade machine from scratch. In this episode I'd like to tell you about the things and thoughts you need to go through when you want to create your own arcade. Before you start, there are a few questions you should have to ask yourself. What games shall be played? Will it be a one or two player cabinet and should it be easy to be transported? The shapes of arcade machines are varying greatly. The most well known type is the upright arcade, where you have to stand in front of it. It is the largest of the arcade phones but also the most impressive one. A more handy and space saving way is a bar top. Here you can reduce your weight and size greatly, but you will need a table for it. The other most interesting way is a table arcade. Here the arcade is built inside a table and you can sit or stand in front of it. It is perfect for multiplayer sessions. For our project we decided to go with a bar top arcade. It is a little bit larger than the others because we included a coin slot and a subwoofer. If you are planning a two player arcade, make sure it's at least 55 cm wide. At least with it starts to be comfortable to play together on it. The main board. Before you actually can start layouting your shape, you need to think about what console generations you like to play on and choose the suitable hardware for it. If you focus on 8 bits and arcade games, a Raspberry Pi 3 Plus or other single board computers like the Banana Pi are the way to go. They offer good performance with low costs. If you are into next generation gaming and emulation, then you should choose something more beefier. A mini ITX mainboard with a small power supply and a decent CPU will provide enough processing power for your 3D dreams to come true. If you don't like to have half PC running in your arcade, you can always choose single board computers based on Intel or AMD CPUs. I post a link in the descriptions for you to the Mauser website listing all kinds of interesting x68 based single board computers. The monitor. There's always a high controversy about monitors and arcade machines. Many people build in a 16 to 9 monitor and others a 4 to 3. We decided on a NEC Multisync LCD 19900SX 4x3 monitor, because 99% of the games are 4 to 3 aspect ratio. Having a 16 to 9 monitor usually makes only sense if you play games that are on next generation consoles starting with the PlayStation 2 and the Xbox 360, or if you plan an ultra-wide body shape. The audio system. 
As you notice set it on the monitor and mainboard, it's time to think about the audio. We decided on two Ground Zero Max 110 watt speakers, which are covering only the mid and high tones, because we implemented a subwoofer to deliver the necessary beef for them. If you want to build as small as possible, then sound bars or portable USB loudspeakers will be the choice for you. As we go with the classic 2.1 system, we need the amplifier. So we connected a Lipi LP168S amplifier to our speakers and subwoofer. The speciality about this one is that the subwoofer channel and the audio channels have separate loudness and gain controls. I place a link in the description below. The controls. Arcade sticks and buttons are at the heart of your gaming experience. The most important rule here is to stay away from cheap AliExpress and similar do-it-yourself kits that are fluting the internet. And it will ruin your carefully planned arcade box when it turns out that the controls are unresponsive, failing or feel cheap. The two most common arcade joystick shapes are the ball top and the bed top style. In North America, the bed top is by far the most common one, with the ball top is being the most common in Japan. American buttons have a long stroke, which is associated with a clicking action, to let the player know when the switch has been activated. The buttons are generally concave and designed to be pressed with one or two fingers. Japanese button design is based on requiring less effort from the player to press. And as such, they have short strokes and very little resistance. However, this also means that players may find it too sensitive, and resting fingers on buttons requires more care. You soon will be forced to decide if you want to use an 8-way or a 4-way joystick. 8-way joysticks give you a great opportunity to our card games that require precise movement in any directions like beaten ups. Having an 8-way stick on a game that does only support 4-way controls, like Pac-Man, will however give you disadvantages or false recognized movements. On such cases, a restrictor plate is needed to restrict the move directions of the 8-way joysticks to 4-way directions. Finally, you need to deliver all those actions to the hardware. Usually a small controller board that connects all the buttons and sticks to a USB port is used. In our case, we decided to go with a mixed setup. We used Japanese style buttons for the flipper and home screen and American style buttons for the game actions. On a recent change, we also replaced one of the bed top with a ball top stick due to the fact that we want to use this arcade machine as a test. If you look for good sources for all of your hardware needs, websites like focusattack.com or arcadejob.com .de will help you find all the parts you need for your arcade machine. I put some links down in the description below. Left versus right. If you are a arcade gamer, you most likely have the understandable question why we built the sticks on the right and the buttons on the left. We are aware that the normal layout is exactly mirrored. To answer that question, let me show you a small borrowed clip from Larry Bundy Jr. You see, with the oncoming North American video game crash, arcade manufacturers were releasing less and less machines. The effect of this was, with nothing to replace them, arcades were holding on to the same games for longer, and their patrons were simply getting better and better at them. So ultimately resulting in less quarters going into these aging machines, causing a snowball effect of lost revenue for operators. But what to do? Arcade owners don't have the know-how to hack into a game and make it even harder, and difficulty dip switches on the arcade boards themselves were virtually non-existent at the time. However, thanks to a rather ingenious arcade owner, they came up with a solution that was simple, yet incredibly effective. Why not simply switch the joystick from the right side of the playfield to the left? I mean, all you need is some basic woodworking skills to accomplish this, and you've thereby artificially inflated the difficulty of every arcade game in your possession simply by messing with right-handed gamers' motor functioning skills. 
Now, there's no actual moment in history to pinpoint who or even when this happened, other than it first emerged around 1982-ish. But the concept swept like wildfire, first from arcade to arcade, and then from country to country. With the concept finally being adopted globally with the introduction of one-size-fits-all jammer cabinets in 1985, the rise of consoles and home computers following suit, the notion of joysticks being on the left was set in game in stone for the rest of time. I linked the full video below, which is certainly a must-watch. For myself as a right-hander, I can say it was the best decision so far. The handling of our games are much more precise. Although if you're a hardcore arcade gamer and very used to the old layout, then you are sure will have some problems getting into it the first few times. The final small detail we gave our arcade machine is a coin slot that triggers the coin button on the arcade games. There will be a special video about how to set that up. With all the parts in place, you finally are set up to start building your actual arcade machine. I recommend to gather all your needed hardware first before thinking about the actual woodwork, layout and shape planning because you will need precise measurement from all of your parts. In the next video I show how we approached all the woodworks, materials and mounting decisions of our arcade. If you have any suggestions and questions please leave a comment below and I hope to see you soon.